Welcome everybody to uh, continuing coverage of the Tomcat track at Apache at home for uh, what's today again, Blur's Day, Wednesday, uh, <laughs> September 30th. Mark Thomas is here to uh, tell us all about the plans for Tomcat 10 and later and the um, recently forked or renamed or whatever Jakarta EE, which no longer means enterprise edition, I'm sure. Thanks, Chris. I have absolutely no idea what the EE stands for these days. Um, it's probably changed about five times since I last looked. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, you'll find me on the Tomcat mailing lists, posting as Mark T at Apache.org. I'm been a committer since around 2003, and my day job is actually as a software engineer at VMware, where I have a very simple job description. It's go and do whatever I think is best for Apache Tomcat. So whilst I have other roles at VMware and I'm involved in other projects at Apache and a few things at the foundation level, the vast majority of my time at the ASF, I spend working on Tomcat. So I wanted to start off today with a little bit of background to try and sort of set the scene for where we are with Jakarta EE and Tomcat 10. So if we go back a few years to Java EE, uh, Tomcat 9 implements a subset of the specifications in Java EE 8. Uh, Java EE 8 is a collection of, oh, I've lost count, it's something like 30, 40 different specifications. And a full Java EE 8 server has to implement most of them, if not all of them. Um, Tomcat only implements a subset and has only ever implemented a subset. Uh, it started off with servlet and Java server pages. Uh, it then added the expression language. Its proper name is Unified Expression Language when um, that was spit out from JSP. And then we added WebSocket as well. It's worth noting that whilst those are the four specifications that everybody thinks of, Tomcat also implements another four. There's the Java debugging support for other languages, um, which is a fairly long-winded way of saying uh, the nice way you get a stack trace pointing you towards a JSP source line rather than the source line in the generated Java when your JSP has a problem. There's the Java Authentication Service Provider Interface for containers, which is basically pluggable authentication. Um, there's not much really available for that at the moment. Um, so the hopes were and still are that a ecosystem will um, build up around that uh, specification. What you can do, and there's an example, I think it's in the docs, although it might be on the wiki, um, you can plug things like Google OAuth into Tomcat authentication using JazzPick. And finally, common annotations. I think that I said there were four extra. Yeah, I lied, there are three extra. So common annotations is the final one. And we implement that one because they essentially got pulled out of the uh, Java runtime environment. So we need to provide them to make sure they're present when running on newer versions of Java. So that was Java EE8, and that's what Tomcat 9 implemented. Then um, Oracle decided for reasons that they would donate Java EE to the Eclipse Foundation. So they did. And the first thing that was produced was Jakarta EE8. That was essentially just a rebadged Java EE8. Um, a few names were changed. There were no functional changes um, to the code at all. There was some very minor cleanup at the level of, oh, there's a typo in the Java doc, so we can fix that. And there weren't any specification documents. Essentially, that was, a, OK, we've copied the source across. Um, make sure the build environment is working, obviously change the name so we can tell the difference, but essentially it was just copy the source across and make sure we can build everything in its new home. So that was Jakarta EE8, and it's essentially, as I say, identical to Java EE8. Then came um, what we're working on at the moment, which is Jakarta EE9. And this is where the changes start. And the first of those changes is a somewhat unfortunate one. 
for again this time legal reasons um the packages for all of the apis have had to change from java x whatever to jakarta whatever so where it was java x servlet it's now had to change to jakarta servlet and the reason for that is despite um, some quite protracted negotiations between Oracle and the Eclipse Foundation, Oracle didn't want to be in a position where anybody else controlled what was happening in the Java X space. So they wanted to retain control of that. That meant that the specs that were in that namespace couldn't effectively change any of the APIs. If they wanted to do anything new, it had to be done in a, a different namespace. And a whole bunch of options were considered do we have a new namespace just for the extra stuff? Do we migrate specs as they want to change? Because some are actually pretty stable and don't need to change the APIs. Do we migrate everything? Um, and after a lot of back and forth, um, and I, the, the conclusion was essentially, well, there aren't any good options here, but the least bad option is if we rename everything all in one go. And that is what happened in Jakarta EE9. So that is anything that had Java X at the beginning now has Jakarta at the beginning instead. So that's all of the Java packages. Um, so in the servlet space, it's things like request attributes, it's system properties, essentially anything. It's a comp in some ways, it's very simple. It's a search replace job done. In other ways, that actually has quite a large impact. There aren't any functional changes in any of the APIs. There isn't any new functionality. There is a little bit more cleanup but only if binary compatible. So for example, um, API methods that were marked as deprecated in the Java doc, but weren't annotated as Java doc, as deprecated in the code, they've now got deprecation annotations. And because that's binary compatible, that was allowed. Now you might think, well, hang on a minute, you're changing the package name. <laughs> You've just thrown binary compatibility completely out of the window why are you limiting yourself to only doing cleanup, no new functionality, no binary incompatible changes? And the reason for that is how we're anticipating people are going to want to migrate from Java EE8 to Jakarta EE9. If we limit the changes to just the package rename and request attributes and everything else, and everything else ret retains essentially binary compatibility, ignoring that rename, then it makes it very easy for automated tools to do that translation for you. Um, and as we'll see a little bit later, you know, even the Tomcat project has written one. As soon as you introduce allowing additional binary incompatible changes, you essentially make the automatic conversion of a web application that works on Java EE8 to Jakarta EE9 an awful lot harder. Um, hence, that's why for Jakarta EE9, the changes have been limited to ignoring the package name, just the binary compatible ones. Uh, also in Jakarta EE9, all the specification documents have been updated. There, uh, that they've had a good general cleanup. Um, again, clarifications have been made there, but again, not ones that implement that mean changes in, in expected behavior. What it has allowed is, you know, obvious typos have been fixed. Um, broken cross references have been fixed things where the language was unclear that's been clarified um, but it, it, those clarifications have remained consistent with both the the test suite and with the existing implementations so essentially it's non-functional changes in in, um, in many ways so what's the impact of this well to be sure in short absolutely everything breaks absolutely everything needs to be updated and absolutely everything needs to be recompiled I so say the good news is if when you decide to make the jump it should be a simple global rename thinking back to tomcat i think it probably took me about oh an hour to do the first rename and make make convince myself i was happy with it and sort out, um, you know, check style rules that got broken and all that sort of thing. And then maybe a couple of minor issues appeared over the next few weeks, but it wasn't actually that big, big a piece of work. Um, one of the consequences of this rename is what you can't do is target Jakarta E8 or Java E8 and Java 9 together. You have to pick one, it's one or the other. So given that there's no new functionality, um, 
it's just a package rename that breaks everything what's kind of the point of this release who in their right minds is going to want to um, update it well it's not really intended for users the intention with jakarta ee9 is that it the primary aud audience for that release is going to be tool vendors the idea is it's to give tool vendors a release that they can work with that they can then update their products to that they can make sure their products work with the new um, namespace so that when Jakarta EE 10 comes along and where we expect users will want to start switching, then the tools already have the support in place and are ready to go. So Jakarta EE 9 isn't really targeted at end users. That being said, if you want to migrate, you are of course more than free to migrate if you wish. And we've got some help to help you do that. Um, migration doesn't have to be painful. And as I said, care has been taken to make sure that the migration process can be automated. So for Tomcat, we've produced an automated migration tool that's available from GitHub at uh, github.com Apache slash Tomcat Jakarta EE migration. And essentially what that does is that takes a war file or, or a jar file, but um, it was intended for, intended for war files. Uh, and it essentially goes through every single file every single jar, every single class, um, and it does byte level manipulation on the classes to change all the Java X references to Jakarta references. And for text files, it will go through and replace references to Java X dot something to Jakarta. So it'll fix JSPs, it'll fix servlets. Um, we've run it on um, the Tomcat examples web app, works quite happily. We have run it on the Jakarta standard tag library or Java standard tag library implementations that ship with Java 9 in order to convert them from Java EE 8 to Jakarta 9 for Tomcat 10. So we didn't touch the source code for that at all. We just took the um, two jar files that make up the tag library, ran them through the conversion tool. Okay, the first time it didn't work, but we, we fixed the, we fixed the um, bugs it highlighted, ran them through the conversion tool and then shipped those with Tomcat 10. Um, and I believe uh, Martin, one of our committers, runs the Wicket sample web application through that migration tool for each Tomcat release as well. One of the things that's been on my to-do list for a while is to actually you know, take a big uh, real-world application, um, and Jira is the one that I've got in mind, and run that through the migration tool and see how that fares. That's still on the um, to-do list. Um, I'm sort of expecting it to take a reasonable amount of time, but to be largely successful. Um, we shall, to be honest, we're going to just have to see how that goes. But if somebody on this session actually has access to Jira and wants to try that and see if they can get Jira working on Tomcat 10, please you know, try it. Do let us know um, how you get on. I'd be very interested to hear that. And if it doesn't work, then obviously we'll see what we need to do to um, enhance the migration tool to handle whichever edge cases or features or file type isn't being handled properly. So that's Jakarta EE9. What are we doing in terms of Tomcat support for that? Um, we're actually in pretty good shape. Um, the Jakarta E9 development work is essentially complete. Essentially, it was essentially the rename. It wasn't really much else. Um, over at Jakarta EE, the work to do the rename, that's that's been done. Uh, the specs have all been um, updated and cleaned up. Uh, there's quite a lot of work there because the I think the specs went through some sort of um, it was either automated from source or it might even have been OCR based, but they certainly needed a, a lot of cleanup. So they, they've been all through that. Um, and essentially the individual specs are all pretty much finished. What's happening at the moment over the Eclipse Foundation is that the overall platform, which is the collection of all of the specifications, Eclipse is going through the process of pulling, bringing all of that together and doing the official platform release. And it's expected that that will happen end of November, beginning of December. So for Tomcat 10, which will support, and it's 10OX, um, for this talk, the second digit in the Tomcat 10 version number is important. So um, please pay attention to it. We're talking now about 10OX. 10, 10 that will support Jakarta EE9. 
and it'll effectively support the same subset of that as Tomcat 9 does for Java E8. So it'll support Servlet, which will now be Servlet 5.0, WebSocket 2.0, Server Pages 3.0, and Expression Language 4. It will also support uh, JazzPick, which is now Jakarta Authentication, Jakarta Annotations, and which one have I forgot? Oh, the uh, Jakarta Debugging Support for the Language. It will support those as well. But the, the four key ones are, are those up on the screen. In terms of progress, as I say, work is pretty much done. Tomcat 10 development has been tracking the specification progress. I've sort of got a footing both camps in that I'm obviously involved in Tomcat, but I also contribute to the uh, relevant specifications over at Eclipse. So we've been keeping Tomcat up to date with that. Um, one of the nice things that's happened as a result of the donation from Oracle to Eclipse is that the TCKs, the testing and compatibility kits, are now freely available. Um, you used to have to jump through an awful lot of hoops in order to um, access the TCK. And the ASF had, has done it in the past, and it was reasonably painful. Um, then it came up for renewal, and it was excessively painful. And in the end, we essentially gave up because the legal constraints that were being placed on having access to the TCK were essentially weren't ones that the SF was prepared to sign up to. So we, we, for a long time, we lost access to the TCKs. We've now had access back, which is great. Um, and we've been running the Tomcat 10 against the, so the Servlet 5 TCK, the WebSocket 2, um, EL4 and GSP3. And the nice thing is, in, from a Tomcat point of view, it's found a couple of edge case Tomcat bugs, which we've been able to fix. Um, some of those were around um, clarification of the exactly what did the spec mean there? Ah, oh, well, you can tell from the TCK what it meant because it's actually testing the expected behavior. So a few clarifications helped us clear up a few things in WebSocket. But it's also worked the other way in that uh, running the TCKs across an, an additional implementation has actually identified various issues in the TCK as well. So I think if anything, we've probably sent more bug fixes back to the TCKs than we've actually implemented in Tomcat. But the upshot is that uh, WebSocket uh, passes, uh, expression language passes, servlet passes with one exception, which uh, one or exceptional failure, depending on how you want to look at it, which is entirely expected because there is an optional feature in the servlet spec that allows you to specify the path you or specify a preferred or a default path for a war file to be deployed at. Um, and Tomcat essentially ignores that and says, no, I'm going to use the file name. Thank you very much. Because by using the file name, um, it can effectively ensure that you don't get conflicts. Like, well, OK, I've got war file a.war and b.war, and they both want, say, their preferred deployment path is slash foo. Which one gets it? Um, don't know, and the spec is silent on how to disambiguate that sort of thing. So um, the Tomcat team took one look at that and said, yeah, no, we don't want any part of that. We'll stick with using the file names because you can't have two files called a.war in the same directory. It just can't be done. Um, so it just removes all of that ambiguity. So that that's an optional feature of the spec that Tomcat doesn't implement, but the TCK tests it, and obviously Tomcat fails that particular test. So the servlet spec we pass with that one exception. And then the JSP spec uh, and TCK, it, to be honest, it's a long time since I've run it, so I'm not sure what the current status is. Last time I checked, I think there are a bunch of failures that were related to bugs that have been reported that I believe have been um, the pull request to fix those bugs have been applied, but what I haven't done is re-downloaded the TCK recently and run the test. Uh, let me just make a note to myself to do that um, in the next few days, make sure um, things are as good as I think they will be. So that's um, Tomcat 10, and we're currently releasing alpha versions. The reason they're alpha versions is one of the criteria we have in order to transition from alpha to beta is that the specs are complete and Tomcat implements them fully. Well, the specs haven't been released yet, so technically they're not complete, so technically we can't transition to beta. Once those specs are final, which I said is going to be late November, early December, then um, we'll be able to transition from alpha to beta. And essentially, 
from a Tomcat's point of view, it's, it's ready now. The implementations are done. There aren't going to be any other API changes because there weren't really any API changes apart from the rename. Um, and we're up to date with all of the, the class clarifications that have been made. So I'm not really expecting um, any further changes. So as soon as the specs go final, then Tomcat will be able to release betas. And then it's just a question of at what point do we transition to stable? Well, what we look for there is really user feedback that um, the, the Tomcat 10o release is stable. Now, given that Tomcat 10OX and Tomcat 9OX have incredibly similar code bases, um, they're practically identical apart from the package rename. And uh, we know that Tomcat 9OX is very stable. Therefore, I'd expect Tomcat 10OX to be just as stable. So given that, I'm not really expecting there to be much time that Tomcat 10OX needs to spend in beta and that it will transition to stable fairly early in 2021. And when I say early, I sort of mean in the first quarter, certainly in the first three months. So that's where we are with Tomcat 10 x and Jakarta EE9. What's the plan for Tomcat EE10 and beyond? So as a project, what we've said is we want to support Java EE8 as long as there's demand from the users to do that, and as long as um, there's enough of a developer community to do that. We obviously also want to support Jakarta EE9 onwards, and we want to provide a path to migrate from Java EE to Jakarta EE. And that's pretty much where we are now. Um, it's worth noting that we're expecting that Jakarta EE10 will follow Jakarta EE9 relatively quickly. Certainly, um, the servlet spec has already been discussing features they'd like to put into the next iteration of the um, spec release. And when we were going through reviewing issues for the other specs, an awful lot of the issues were marked up with, yep, that's got to be for Jakarta EE10 because it's an API change or it's a new feature or it's a behavior change or it's essentially something that wasn't um, maintaining existing functionality, no API changes. So there's, there is a sort of a head of steam there waiting to be implemented. So I would expect Jakarta EE10 to follow reasonably quickly. So if we look at what this means for Tomcat releases, where we are at the moment is 10OX is supporting Jakarta EE9, which is currently under development, but about to be released soon. 9OX supports Java EE8. 85X supports Java EE7. 7OX supports Java EE6. It's worth noting that Tomcat 7 will be end of life uh, 31st of March next year. So you have six months to think about migrating. And we have a migration tool to get you from Java EE8 to Jakarta EE9. So what's the Tomcat support going to look like for Jakarta EE10 onwards? Well, 10OX will support Jakarta EE9, but only until 1X is stable. So 10OX is expected to be a relatively short-lived release. And that is really to reflect that, that Jakarta EE9 is really aimed at tool vendors, not users. So 10.1X is going to provide the long-term support for Jakarta EE10. And then looking ahead, you know, typically three years, Jakarta EE11 support, that will be Tomcat 11OX. So what you'll be able to see is we've managed to remove the off by one error so that Jakarta EEY will be supported by Tomcat YOX. Now that will hopefully continue as long as the Jakarta EE versioning scheme doesn't change. If that changes, then all bets are off and we might need to think about Tomcat versioning as well, because we've, what we've always done historically is aligned the major Tomcat version with the what's now known as the Jakarta EE platform version. For Java EE8, as long as there's a viable user community requiring it, we'll, we'll continue to support it but that support will always track the latest stable Tomcat release. So there will be a Tomcat 9.10.x, and that will be essentially identical to Tomcat 10.1, but rather than having the Jakarta EE10 API, it'll have the Java EE8 API. Then there will be, when Tomcat 11 comes out, we'll transition to Tomcat 9.11x, and that will have basically be identical to Tomcat 11OX, but again, rather than the Jakarta EE 11 API, it'll have the Java EE 8 API. And the same for Tomcat YOX, 
that'll be uh, Tomcat 9YX will be an exact copy of it, but it'll have the Java EE8 API. So the idea is that you'll always have access to something that supports Java EE8, but it, there isn't too much of, of a maintenance burden on the Tomcat team. We will expect users to always update to the latest 9.y.x release for fixes. So if you're using 9.11.3 and you have a bug, and the latest release is 9.11.2. That bug will get fixed in 9.11. Sorry, I'm start again because I'm confusing myself. Right, you're using 9.11.2. You find a bug. The latest release is 9.12.4. Say, we'll fix that in 9.12.5, and you will have to upgrade to 9.12.5 in order to get that bug fixed. We won't be maintaining parallel 9.11, 9.12, 9.13. It will just be the latest one that is supported. We will continue to support three major releases in parallel. So at the moment, that's nine, eight, and seven. Come March next year, that's going to be 10, nine, and eight, plus the Java EE8 compatible release. And the Tomcat major versions will continue to track the Jakarta EE platform releases. And Based on past experience, certainly since Tomcat 5 and possibly going back as Tomcat 4, I'd need to double check the date. Every major Tomcat release has been supported for give or take 10 years. So when Tomcat 7 reaches end of life in March next year, Tomcat 7 will have been supported for about 10 years, as was Tomcat 6 when it reached end of life, as was Tomcat 5, 5 when it re reached end of life. So we're expecting that to continue. So eventually very long term you'll end up on tomcat n.y.x uh, main development branch that will support jakarta een tomcat n minus one will support jakarta ee n minus one tomcat n minus two will support jakarta ee n minus two and alongside that there will be tomcat 9.n which supports java ee8 but it it will essentially apart from that api change be identical to uh, the latest Tomcat N release. Now, hopefully that makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, then there's a page on the wiki that tries to explain it as well. If you've still got questions, feel free to ask them in the um, in the chat here or on the users list. We'll be happy to um, explain what's going on. But in summary, it's continue off three major versions in parallel and provide a version for certainly as far into the future as we can see at the moment that will support Java EE8. Obviously, if everybody jumps ship from Java EE to Jakarta EE in a very short space of time and there's no demand for Java EE support, then we'll stop supporting, we'll stop providing Java uh, EE8 support. But as long as there's demand for it, we're going to continue to provide it. Uh, I wanted to finish up just with a brief discussion of the Jakarta EE roadmap. Um, the very long term stuff is still very much under discussion. So what's what is Jakarta E10 going to look like? Don't know. Are there going to be any major themes a bit like there sometimes were for the Java E releases? Don't know. Um, and certainly no clue as to what those themes might be. For the individual specifications that I'm involved in, there are a number of things that sort of come under short term, easy to implement, minor enhancements and fixes, but nevertheless are new functionality and API changes and other changes in behavior. To support those, it's quite possible there might be additional releases of individual specifications. So my expectation is that, well, I know that for Jakarta EE9, it's going to be server at five. I would expect for Jakarta EE10, it will be served at 6.0. What that means is there might be servlet 5.1, possibly even servlet 5.2 in between as well, which provides incremental access to additional functionality. And there's certainly a discussion about servlet 5.1 happening at the moment. Um, what's being discussed there is a little bit of cleanup, um, sort of improving Java doc type stuff and primarily adding support to cookies for the same site attributes, making that part of the standard API. The way we're currently anticipating handling those in Tomcat is that we will handle them the same way we used to handle uh, maintenance releases of the spec. So if Tomcat 
10OX is supporting Servlet 5.0. If there's a Servlet 5.1 release, Tomcat 10OX would update to Servlet 5.1 in the next Tomcat 10OX release. So we would just pick up that update uh, in the next um, minor release. Now that uh, might be slightly different to what you would expect. So there wouldn't be a 10.1 to pick up Servlet 5.1, partly because the individual specs can update at different times and partly for consistency for how we did things in the past. Certainly we'll do that for as long as the Jakarta E specs stick to the we're not going to break backwards compatibility. Um, I would expect um, if a decision is made to break backwards compatibility, for example, removing the methods from the server API that have been deprecated for well over a decade, I would expect that to happen in a major release. So for it might happen. I don't think it will, but it might in Servlet 6. Um, I wouldn't, I'd never expect to see that, say, between 5.0 and 5.1 or between 6.0 and 6.1. That would happen in a 6.0, a 7.0 or, or an 8.0. Or, and there, there are people certainly arguing for that, that it'll, it'll never happen and it, uh, backwards compatibility is king and it, uh, it will be maintained forevermore. Um, that's really a, a discussion that the community keeps coming back to and there isn't really a consensus yet. So, um, it's, a, it's a wait and see on that particular bit of it. So with that, um, that brings me to questions. So, ah, Chris, and Chris tells me that I'm the last session of the day, so I can go on for as long as I like. Fantastic. Right. <laughs> actually worth Bring on the questions. questions. Let me back up to the beginning here. So um, actually, I had a question just to confirm. Shoot. Essentially, the difference between Jakarta EE 8 and 9 is the package rename. So yes. when you've been talking about Tomcat 9 as supporting Jakarta EE 8 indefinitely, that's for projects that just never get a migration, right? OK, Jakarta, this is where it gets entertaining. Jakarta EE 8 is identical, apart from a rename, to Java EE 8. The, the, the package rename comes in between Jakarta EE 8 and Jakarta EE 9. So Tomcat 9 will support Java EE8 or Jakarta EE8, depending on what you want to call it, because it's the same thing, just with a different name, um, for as long as there is demand and a viable community to do so. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm, I'm conscious that with all of these, the, 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 these similar names and exactly where the change happens, um, it's possible I might have misspoke at some point. So please feel free to ask any clarification questions if you have them. Okay, and I have some academic interest here. If you were to take the Tomcat migration tool and mm -hmm. run it on Tomcat 9 right now, would it most likely produce essentially Tomcat 10? Um, it should do. Um, yeah, and you, you need to run it on each individual jar, but yes, you should. It's, Give or take a, a, a few new features and deprecated code that's been removed, code that was deprecated in nine that's been removed in 10. Yes, if you ran the migration tool on Tomcat 9, I would expect you to get Tomcat 10 out. I haven't tried it. But now I know I think what you're doing. That an right. exercise for the student. <laughs> okay, I think there were a few others. Let's see. No, actually, I don't see. Oh, wait. Um, I think we answered in the chat some other questions. Tomcat 9.n.x will build yeah. against which JDK? I believe the answer is eight forever, right? Um, that would be my intention at this point. Um, where that gets interesting is for newer versions of Tomcat will obviously, well, one assumes, don't know yet, that newer versions of Java EE are going to target later versions of the JDK. Um, with that in mind, Tomcat internals could take advantage of features available in those later versions. 
that does then raise the question, well, how do you handle that when you backport it to Tomcat 9 dot whatever we happen to be on at the time? Um, and I think the answer is it depends. Initially, I can see us backporting the functionality and making sure it works on 8. Once you get to the point where Java 8 is no longer supported, then I can potentially, and this is just uh, me thinking out loud, haven't discussed it with the community, there's absolutely no consensus behind this idea whatsoever, it's just me thinking, is that it will build with whatever the oldest supported LTS version is at the time. Um, but whether, whether that we end up actually keeping it building on Java 8 for longer than that, it's a, we'll see what happens when we get there and we'll, we'll as we always do, try and do what, do what we think is best for the community at the time. I remember a while back when we were looking at how to do this, we were thinking, we we're trying to decide if there was a possible way to support on a single running server um, applications that were written for either of these two, uh, let's say lines <laughs> yeah. of the spec. Um, and we we discarded that because we thought it would be way too complicated. If um, we have what, way too complicated stroke impossible. Um, right there well, there are I'm wondering, I'm wondering if the migration tool gets really good could we do like on the fly migration deployments yes good question um, i think we could I and mean, there were sort of back when the um the whole package rename thing was being discussed over at eclipse there were thoughts around well you could either do it offline before deployment at deployment or heck just you know do it in, do it in the class loader and do it on the fly as you load the classes um i don't like that last option um that just strikes me as far too risky um and there, there are performance implications i don't particularly like but certainly doing it at deployment time i think is a possibility and the way i think i would do it is essentially we're doing class scanning anyway, so we could detect, hang on a minute, that's a um, Java X servlet class, that won't work. We could then run the war file through the deployer, assuming this is all happening with automatic deployment. So let's say it's foo.war that's trying to be deployed. We could run it through the converter, drop that into, excuse me, the web apps directory as foo hash hash converted essentially take take advantage of the parallel deployment features and bingo tomcat will deploy that one and it, it should just work it's certainly possible um i guess it's a wait and see how much demand there is for that kind of um work that would be some wonderful hand wavy magic especially for teams where you know they built their application on servlet 2.0 They've been dragging it forward, making no changes, making no updates. It's, of course, absolutely mission critical. It's so critical that they can't hire anyone to um, work on it. And yep. so they're going to need to drag it forward forever. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I personally, I think in, in that scenario, I'd probably build a VM where it worked and then just wrap that VM in the world's biggest firewall and just leave it running whatever awful, unsecured, CVE-riddled versions of software it's currently running. Um, <laughs> but that, that, that's just me. I see some questions about Spring Boot. Um, the issue with Spring Boot, I believe, um, is that one of the things that Spring Boot does as an optimization is you've basically got jars within jars but for the outer level it doesn't do any compression what that lets you do is essentially um random seeks which gives you much faster performance when you're trying to serve resources the migration tool to work with a jar in that format would need a few tweaks to spot that are ah, this this particular jar at this point in the nested tree of jars that i'm unpacking 
that was created without compression. So when I recreate the new one, I need to recreate that one without compression as well. In theory, that should be possible. Um, I, I could well be missing something obvious that means it isn't, but that sounds doable. Um, don't see why we couldn't do that. Um, again, exercise for interested participants who wants to go and have a play with that. Pull requests are always very welcome. Other questions? I can actually see the chat today, which is good. We're definitely getting down a rat, going down a rat hole with all of the issues of migrations. But um, uh, would, well, it's, that's what it's going, to, it's going to be one big rat hole, isn't it? It's right. I would it, recommend uh, anyone who's interested in looking into this uh, join the Tomcat users list and give the migration tool a try see how it works we'll find the things that don't work and uh get them fixed uh remy has helpfully pointed out in the chat what the problem is with the um uncompressed approach yes <laughs> yes buffer tastic is what you end up having to do and it's yeah and we, we just need to have another you either need a lot of memory or um, we'd have to change change the way it works so it wrote stuff out to disk or something because at the minute it's all done via streaming um so gotcha. yeah there, there 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 are ways to solve it um but it would need a bit of rearchitecting to do that but yeah you know pull requests always welcome all right we're a couple minutes over and i'm sure folks want to get on to other uh sessions and other tracks. I do want to put in a quick plug again for the Tomcat Birds of a Feather, which will be at 2015 UTC this evening and staying, well, yeah, I guess that's evening no matter where you are. Um, is that in about an hour and 15 minutes? That is, I don't know. My clock Two says hours. 1458. So what does yours say? Yours, yours is right. Well, right? I, I, I'm not in UTC either. Um, it's either in an hour and 15 or two, two hours and 15. I'm not sure which. <laughs> All right, whichever it is, uh, we'll I would encourage uh, I would encourage everyone to to pop in and say hello at least for a short period of time. I know I'm going to be jumping back and forth between that and the whiskey birds of a feather, which everyone is welcome to as well. And um, Oops, we'd sorry. love to see you tomorrow for the final day of Tom T Cat Track. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for sticking with it. Appreciate it. Have a good day.